तंत्र को संसार करने का काम किया ये कौन किसका राज था बीबीसी पर प्रबंध किसने लगाया था ये किसका राज था अब बीबीसी में हमला किया है बीबीसी की क्रेडिबिलिटी एक्स्ट्रॉर्डनरी है देश में दुनिया के अंदर एक्स्ट्रॉर्डनरी है आज भी गाँव के लोग जो है बीबीसी सुनते हैं और ये कहते हैं हाँ बीबीसी में न्यूज आ गई मैं चालीस साल देख रहा हूँ बीबीसी में रेडियो न्यूज हो चाहे टी वी लग गई तो आज भी लोगों में उसकी क्रेडिबिलिटी है कारण बताना चाहिए देशवासियों को भाई आपने बीबीसी की जैसी संस्था को भी आपने टारगेट क्यों बनाया है विश्व में पहली बार विश्व में पहली बार बीबीसी के सौ साल के इतिहास में उन पर इस प्रकार की कोई छापा मारी और रेड हुई है और उनका कसूर क्या था उन्होंने एक गुजरात के दंगों की डॉक्यूमेंट्री बनाई थी जिसमें कि सभी का पक्ष रखा था जी ट्वेंटी का एक तरफ से जी ट्वेंटी का वो जो है वो उसकी बार बार बात करते हैं विश्व गुरु की बात करते हैं दूसरी तरफ से आप बीबीसी जैसी जो क्रेडिबल एजेंसी है न्यूज एजेंसी है उस पर छापा मारते हो उस पर रेड करते हो तो मैसेज क्या जाता है बाहर दूसरी तरफ से गरीबों के घर डेमोलिश कर रहे हो तो उसका मैसेज क्या जाता है बाहर उसका मैसेज बहुत खराब जाता है कि जो हिंदुस्तान है वो आगे जाने के बजाय पीछे जा रहा है राज्यसभा एमपी महेश जेठ मलानी स्पोक टू राजदीप सारदेसाई ऑन द बीबीसी रेड्स लिसन Uh, and I asked him this question at the start. The search, my Jack Malani, of the income tax comes at a time within a month of the BBC airing a critical documentary on Prime Minister Modi. It also comes at a time when you, among others, have gone ahead and said that all of this is part of a Chinese propaganda. That BBC today is financed by Chinese state-owned companies, and therefore the BBC's finances need to be looked at. You want to expand on that? Yeah, I said, and I, 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 I've done this on Twitter. And whatever I've said on Twitter regarding the BBC, uh, I mean, there have been a number of tweets. I backed it up with all uh, with evidence that is in the public domain, and the BBC hasn't ever denied that. So, but uh, you know, th that doesn't mean that just because I've tweeted these ways have happened. No, are you questioning? I want clarity. Are you questioning my Jack Malani the finances of the BBC? If the BBC has committed financial irregularities, surely that should have come out in the open by now by a British government inquiry. You are you is this? Are, are you convinced that the BBC is guilty of financial irregularities involving the Chinese? Well, I, I, I'm certainly saying that they, they, because of the extent and quantum of financial interlocking, right? They are highly dependent on the Chinese, and to use the words. Of a British MP who was highly critical of the BBC and its financial shenanigans with the Chinese, right? Have my bread, you will sing my song. You know, but you're saying this at a time when, let's be honest, Mr. Uh, uh, Jet Malani, the BBC over the years has built a huge credibility as a fine journalistic organisation. Are you saying all of that has to be thrown out of the window because, according to you, and this is according to you, it is today funded by Chinese-owned companies? The fact is, a large part of the BBC's finances still come through the British taxpayer. Well, this is this financial uh, interlocking is not. Uh, with the overseas, with uh, with the BBC in the UK, this financial interlocking it's through an overseas entity controlled by the BBC mm -hmm. called uh, StoryWorks, and most of the money, the funding comes uh, into this company. All the Chinese state-owned uh, uh, financing is 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 put through this company, and so there's a there's a there's a you you are with upon the China wall between what happened in the UK, right, and what happens with stories uh, uh, which are which are which are publicised uh, in places like India. Right? So here it's it is uh, StoryWorks which really produces those documentaries. They are financed by the Chinese. Mm -hmm. They invest their pension funds with the Chinese, and so does BBC uh, uh, UK. Right? Invest their funds more than 150 million pounds, and there is this financial interlocking. And th th there is no other explanation why the BBC has persistently indulged in anti-India propaganda. Right? Not uh, publishing a flag of India without Jammu and Kashmir, constantly castigating and berating the Indian Army. Right? Often without cogent evidence. Right? And the most latest episode. Right? So it's about time if you are. As your own MP says, and there's a lot of criticism about the BBC's China, uh, Chinese financial links in the UK. Uh, it's all in the public domain. I think you can read this. It's not just me who's saying it. The, the, it, has, it has rattled a lot of people and upset a lot of people who were former admirers. And I, I, I am a former admirer of the BBC. Right? It, it, it was a very credible institution, but that doesn't mean that credible institutions can rely on past reputation and suck up money from the Chinese and then sing their song. But you know, Mr. Jetpal, I just to clarify, this documentary was aired on BBC Two in the United Kingdom. Are you saying, therefore, that no journalistic scrutiny took place because it was pure Chinese propaganda in your view to undermine the Modi government? Isn't that a bit of a stretch to suggest that because there is a Chinese company that you allegedly claim finances the BJP, uh, BBC, that's why this documentary was done to undermine Prime Minister Modi? No, it's not a stretch. It's not a stretch. It's not a stretch because I am going by extent and quantum of funding. I am going by criticism in the UK by none, none, none other than a member of the of the of the parliamentary committee that liaisons on China with Lord Alton. I am also going. I am also going by the nature of. The extremely 
uh, pernicious propaganda, anti-India propaganda no, that they are they're spreading so this organization uh, storybooks. You know, with due regard, uh, uh, Mr. Jetmalani, when you keep saying anti-India propaganda at times, you almost seem to be sounding like Indira Gandhi in the 1970s. You know, this is how she tried to drive out the BBC out of the country. You know, my, my point is, this is a majority government, you've got all the power. What, why are you worried about what a BBC documentary has to call it part of anti-India propaganda only makes that documentary appear even bigger than it is, as I said. I mean, are you in a way, isn't that a bit of a self-goal, a stretch? Well, it's, no, what is a bit, what is a bit of a stretch is that the, the Indian Prime Minister has been hauled over the coals of this country, right? By an SIT monitored by the court, no less, right? It has also been cleared by the courts. The Gujarat riot episode has been dealt with in detail. There's been a searching inquiry. There's a reasoned judgment. The, B B the BBC now arrogates itself to itself because it has a past reputation. And I make this charge, right? The right to overrule all that without any cogent evidence, relying particularly, and I haven't come up with everything on the BBC yet, right? relying upon an inquiry by a gentleman called Jack Straw, who was foreign secretary in 2002 at the time of the riots, mm -hmm. who himself is under a very serious cloud, not just for a false report on the weapons of mass destruction issue mm -hmm. regarding Iraq, mm -hmm. but for his conduct and role in the manner of, in the, in the matter of having this inquiry and the report uh, but, propagated in 2002. You know, you're, you're going into Jack Straw's credibility. You have every right to speak up. But, you know, the whole question arises. Let's look at what has been your central argument that the BBC has questionable finances. Now, at no stage do I see the Sunak government saying that. It seems that Mahesh Jetmalani sitting here in India after this documentary is aired is suddenly saying it. No, 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 no I'm sorry, sorry. Rajiv, you can't get away with that. No less a person than the than Prime Minister Sunak has completely rejected the BBC report. That's the documentary. I'm he talking about your charges. It's not worth the paper on which it's written. No, no, I'm talking about your charges, Mr. Mr. Jetmalani, of financial irregularity. Please show me where the BBC has found its finances now being questioned by the British government. They have. I'm telling you that uh, you, you please uh, read my tweets and read the supporting evidence and then make up your mind. Have you read all those, have you read I have. All those articles I, I, uh, next to my tweets? Have you read other material in the public domain about uh, the BBC's Chinese financing? I used to. Have you? No, no, have you? Have no, you? no have I you? have, and I, I want to understand clearly. Are you suggesting today that the IT raids that took today, therefore, are based on this evidence which you claim is in the domain about Chinese involvement, or are you delinking the two? No, no, no. Now, we're now, on an inductive leap here. You are attributing an inductive leap to me. I am not suggesting that. Please don't, don't, please don't make false assumptions, right? Don't put words in my mouth. I am not saying that at all, Rajvi. I am not saying in, the income tax has a right. There's a presumption of constitutionality and legality, even though people of your ilk might not think, or think so. Of, of their actions. You have to judge them with the results of this survey. Mm -hmm. Not now. To jump and scream murder and murder foul at this stage is a little premature. I would hold my horses before you have egg on your face, uh, Ratvi. No, no, are you therefore telling me in conclusion that please do not call it the murder of the free press merely on the fact that the BBC has been raided today? That's your central point. Am I correct? I fully agree with you. I think for once you put my uh, thoughts pretty accurately. That's all I'm saying regarding the IT rates. As regards BBC's finan finance, uh, financial interlocking with the Chinese companies, it's all there in the public domain. Are you also saying a warning should be sent to the BBC, a ban imposed on the BBC? Is that what Mahesh Jetmanani is calling for? No, I'm not going that far at all. I'm at this stage, so far as the IT, IT rates are concerned, Rajvi, I am at this stage confining myself to saying, let's see, maybe the optics are bad because it comes in the wake of the BBC documentary, right? But give the IT department a chance to come out with the material on the basis of which they have, in, they have initiated this, in, this uh, uh, survey and any raids that might follow. And let us see what comes, if, if they come out with any evidence of financial irregularities. Already there's some talk of transfer pricing violations and all that, but I don't even want to get into that realm because it's too premature. One final question. Do you believe this hurts India's image, brand Modi's image, G20 year? Here we are seen raiding the BBC and calling it a brushed organization. No, I think globally India will be seen as a country which does not like unwarranted reports, in, in, which, are, which are basically initiated at the instance of enemies of this country. Okay. We will be able to establish that, I feel. And also, that we should not take this kind of nonsense from institutions who are resting on their past laurels, but today are extremely tainted financially. Well, there's a very short commercial break. On that note, when we return, Hindu Ray hate reaches on in Canada, Ram under DKs in Canada's Ontario. You are watching India Today.
वॉचिंग इंडिया टुडे Hindu hate rages on in Canada Ram Mandir defaced in Canada's Ontario miscreants vandalized the Ram Mandir with anti Bharat and pro Khalistani graffiti the miscreants wore anti Modi anti Hindu slogans as well pro BBC graffitis were also painted on the temple walls this is not the first time that a Hindu temple in Canada has been defaced with anti India slogans and pictures earlier in Jan anti India paintings cropped up on a Hindu temple in Brampton that sparked outrage from the Indian community in September 22 Swami Narayan Mandir in Canada was defaced by Canadian Khalistani extremists with anti India graffiti BJP and BHP have now demanded strict action against the perpetrators of the latest attack from local police authorities and ontario government the consul general of india has also strongly condemned the incident demanding prompt action मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि मिसी सोगा में जैसे राम मंदिर पर भारत विरोधी नारे लगे कनाडा में मंदिर तोड़ा गया ये कुछ और नहीं इनकी खींच निकल रही है और ये बहुत कुछ नहीं कर पाएंगे पर ये जो है इनकी भी अलग से पहचान हो रही है और ये बताया जा रहा है कि अभी भी भारत मैं जिस प्रकार से भारत विरोधी लोग पनपते हैं वो कहीं ना कहीं जाके अपना प्रतिरोध व्यक्त करते हैं अपना विरोध व्यक्त करते हैं जो एक तरह से धार्मिक दृष्टि से भी ठीक नहीं है और एक कानून की दृष्टि से भी ठीक नहीं है बी स्ट्रॉगली कंडेम दी परसिस्टेंट अटैक्स ऑन हिंदू टेम्पल्स इन कैनेडा दीज इंसिडेंट्स मस्ट नाउ स्टॉप इमीजिएटली एंड द कनाडियंस गवर्नमेंट सो टेक सीवियर इमीजिएट एंड एसेंजेंट एक्शन अगेंस्ट दोज परपेटेटर्स हु आर डूइंग दिस सिंफुल एक्ट्स Not only Canada temples have been vandalized in Australia as well in a similar fashion Hindu temples have been targeted on multiple occasions in Victoria and Melbourne in the recent past Amendra Kumar Singh president of Sri Lankan Hindu Association spoke on this issue a little while back listen in Hatred of Hindus is the fuel that keeps the Khalistan movement burning this is a well thought out strategy it's a two two pronged strategy firstly hold these bogus referendums and secondly attack Hindus physically in their places of worship and in an attempt to intimidate them and to silence them Here are the latest developments from Turkey over a week after the deadly quake struck the country. A dog was rescued from rubble in Samandag, southern Turkey on Tuesday, 8 days after the worst quake in country's modern history. Istanbul mayor wrote on social media that the dog owners had perished in the disaster. A 77-year-old man was rescued from the rubble in Aydemir on Tuesday, 212 hours after a 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck Turkey and Syria. Rescuers are still pulling out survivors from ground more than a week after the initial quake. Drone footage shot over one of the regions of Turkey showed construction machinery clearing rubble from buildings that collapsed. The combined death toll in Turkey and neighboring Syria has topped 41,000 and many survivors have been left homeless in near freezing winter temperatures. Rescuers left near the wreckage of buildings warmed up by blankets and campfire in southern Turkish city of Antakya. Turkey's urbanization minister uh, Kurum has said that some 42,000 buildings had either collapsed or were in urgent need of demolition or severely damaged across 10 cities. A minute silence was observed before two Champions League matches in Paris and Milan as a mark of respect for the victims of earthquake in Syria and Turkey. Players, officials, and fans stood in silence before the round 16 of matches between PSG and Munich in France and AC Milan against Tottenham Hotspur in Italy. Turkish celebrity chef and internet sensation Salt Bey, known for his unique style of seasoning steaks, has come forward to help those who are affected in the earthquake, promising to feed 5,000 victims every day. Here's a look at a heartwarming story. celebrity chef and social media sensation Nusrat Gokçe known for his unique style of seasoning steaks has now turned savior for his homeland Turkey as the country reels under the aftermath of one of the deadliest earthquakes Salt Bey who hails from Pasali has come forward to help his fellow countrymen the famous restauranteur has arranged for a mobile kitchen to go to the disaster zone and pledged to provide food to at least 5000 earthquake survivors every day he says this is the most important and meaningful service in the world While most social media users praised Salt Bay, some thought of his food service to be a publicity stunt. Recently, he hit the headlines for finding his way to the pitch after the FIFA finals, kicking pictures with Argentinian players despite their clear annoyance and holding the World Cup trophy. He was put under investigation by the world football body then. But looks like he's now looking for redemption. Bureau report, India today. So we do a very short commercial break but when we return up next five live with Shiver Wood a new dawn 100% DC combat aircraft this is not in moments from now stay with us You are watching India today
after decades of dependence on imports. India's most ambitious military journey begins. The journey towards fighter self-reliance. A new dawn for 100% Desi combat aircraft. India today reveals Mission 470. It's called Mission 470 informally and we've got a big news break on something that's going to be an absolute milestone, a game changer as far as Atma Nirbhar Bharat in defence is concerned. Remember, since independence viewer, India and India's Air Force have been completely dependent, mostly for understandable reasons, on foreign combat aircraft. All of that is about to change just 12 months from now and I'm going to show you some hard facts that will change your mind about it. I'm Shiv, this is Five Live, big special broadcast coming up, the headlines first. Chilling replay of Shraddha murder, girlfriend killed, body stored in fridge of a Dhaba. Man webs another woman on the day of the murder. India Today accesses CCTV video. We've got a special report coming up at 6 p.m. Army personnel beaten to death by DMK counsellor and nine aides. DMK Neta Chinnaswamy on the run. His son has been arrested. Day two of searches at BBC offices by Income Tax Department. Sources say searches may be on for three days. BBC asks employees to cooperate with the probe. War over revered Shiva Shrine, Assam government advertisement claims the 6th Jyotirlinga in Kamrup in Assam. Udhav Sena claims the 6th Jyotirling is in Pune. Says first projects, now gods taken away. Death toll from Turkey and Syria, earthquakes cross over 40,000 more people found alive as rescue efforts continue for over 200 hours and counting. This truly is all about Atma Nirbharta. In just 12 months from now, viewer, something is going to happen. Something is going to change that takes the current game of India's overt, overwhelming dependence on foreign weapons and foreign combat aircraft and turn it completely on its head. Watch this exclusive report by India Today's Akshay Dongri. It's an informal mission called Mission 470. And it's something that's going to turn India from a country that has always imported weapons and systems for its air force to one that makes its own and sells them abroad. Watch this exclusive report. This is Mission 470. Ripping up the skies over India's aerospace capital, fighters from India and the world in a deadly aerial dance. But amidst all the sound and fury that only a jet engine can exude, there's a thundering new dawn rising for the Indian Air Force. One that seeks to take decades of legacy dependence on outside fighter tech and replace it with India's own. India today has learned that this ambitious drive is being informally called Mission 470. And the reason for that, in case you hadn't guessed, is that starting February next year, the Indian Air Force will begin receiving the first of 470 fighters designed and built right here in India. Let's take you step by step through this big plan. Things will kick off in February 2024 with the delivery of the first of 83 LCA Tejas Mark 1A fighters, a hugely improved version of the current Tejas in service. Meanwhile, the Indian Air Force will also begin to order 108 LCA Mark II jets, aircraft that are derived from the original Tejas but enormously more capable, with better performance, stronger engines and far superior capabilities. You're familiar with the LCA Tejas, but this is the Mark II and it's actually a vastly different aircraft. It's actually a bigger aircraft. This scale model tells you a little bit about how that final look is going to be. Some big differences. It's a heavier, longer aircraft. As you can see, it has these canard four planes here for greater maneuverability. It actually increases the agility of this fighter. If you look at the weapon systems on board the LCA Mark II, it can actually carry a much larger range and more weapons than the LCA can. Very, very importantly, if you come to the back, you can't really see it here in the model, but the engine that goes on the LCA Mark II is going to be a much more powerful engine on the existing LCA Tejas of the Indian Air Force. While this happens over a decade, India's most advanced fighter in development, the fifth generation stealthy AMCA will come online and begin deliveries of at least 126 units to the Indian Air Force. On a parallel track, the Indian Navy will also begin receiving 100 twin-engine deck-based fighters or TEDBF for its aircraft carriers, fully purpose-built naval jets to meet the Indian Navy's future requirements. Well into the next decade, that translates into 470 Indian-designed, Indian-built fighters for the Indian Air Force and Indian Navy. With Defence Minister Rajnath Singh declaring that three-quarters of India's present and future weapon modernisation budgets will be reserved for Indian industry, the future looks bright. But nothing is ever as simple as it looks.